In this video, we are going to read Peak Experience, uh, the chapter from Peak by Roland Smith. We arrived at base camp just in time to see Josh get into a fist fight with someone. At 18,044 feet, though, it wasn't much of a fight. An older red-faced man took a swing, which Josh easily ducked, and countered by pushing him in the chest. The man landed on his butt in the snow. After this, it was pretty much over, except for the shouting. I want a full refund, the man shouted. If you think I'm going to sit around base camp while you and the others climb to glory, you have another thing coming. He was obviously one of Josh's clients, and not a very happy one. It's hard to get up when you're out of breath, swaddled in down clothes with crampons strapped to your boots. Josh offered his hand to help him up, but the man slapped it away. George, you're in no shape to go any farther up the mountain, Josh said. You heard what Dr. Krieger said. You have a bad heart, which you should have told me about before you signed up. My heart's fine. That witch doctor of yours doesn't know what she's talking about. A pretty woman stepped up next to Josh. You have a heart, murmured George. She said with a slight German accent, blocked arteries would be my guest. You need to get it looked at as soon as you get off the mountain. Well, I'm getting off this stupid mountain today, George wheezed, getting to his feet. And my first appointment is not going to be with my doctor. It's going to be with my attorney. I'll sue you for everything you have, Josh. If you want to sue me for saving your life, Josh said, go ahead. He turned and started to walk away, then noticed us and stopped. Looks like you have an extra climbing permit, Zopa said. Two, actually. We had a woman leave two days ago, hacking up her larynx. Apparently I'm responsible because she's threatening to sue me too. Josh looked at me. The beard he had cut off from my arraignment was growing back in nicely. So how was it, he asked. It was good. He looked back at Zopa. Can he make it up the mountain? Zopa shrugged. Josh glanced over at the truck where Sun Ho, Yogi, and Yash were standing. Do you have room to take George back down? Zopa nodded. Those three are staying. That is, if you have work. We'll see, Josh said without much enthusiasm. We might need some base camp help, but with two less climbers, we don't need any more climbing Sherpas. He looked back at the small truck, then looked back at Zopa. It'll be a tight fit. You'll have to haul George's wife down, too, and all their gear. She's in her tent, sick as a dog. You'll need to get them both to the hospital as soon as you get to Kathmandu. There will be enough room, Zopa said. I'm staying here, too, at least for a few days. I'll talk to the driver. He'll get them to Kathmandu safely. Zopa started toward the truck, but didn't get very far. A jeep came roaring up and skidded to a stop, blocking his path. Josh swore, then said under his breath, Captain Sheck, be cool. Let me do the talking. A tall Chinese officer in a crisp green uniform got out of the jeep and walked up to us, frowning. Papers! Good afternoon, Josh said with a smile. No one go until I see papers. Of course, Josh said, but the captain was too late. Sunho, Yogi, and Yash were already gone. Poof! Remember seeing that before, where the judge earlier said, Poof! Notice a trend here. Show him your visa and passport, Josh said. I dug them out of my pot pack and handed them over. Captain Sheck carefully scrutinized them, glancing between me and the photo. You climb! He's my son, Josh answered. He's on my climbing permit. Last name, no match! He has his mother's name. We're divorced. I guess it was too complicated to explain that they were never married. The captain handed back my passport. Next, he checked Zopa's papers, then the driver's. After he finished, he locked his dark eyes on each of us and said, We watching all you. He climbed back into the jeep and drove away. He's not kidding about that, Josh said. Captain Sheck and his men are always watching. He pointed to a small rise with a ramshackle building on top of it. They have a spotting scope set up there. 
and the rumor is that he has night vision equipment as well. They monitor the radio transmissions looking for violations. Sheck's already booted two climbing parties this year. Try to stay clear of him. And he doesn't always show up dressed in uniform, Dr. Krieger warned. He sometimes dresses like a climber and wanders around camp catching people unaware. I'll be in the aid tent. She walked away. What do you think of base camp so far, Josh asked. Because of the argument and Captain Sheck, I hadn't paid much attention to the camp, but I saw now that it was gigantic. Red, blue, green, and yellow tents were scattered around for what seemed like a mile. How many people are here? 350 or so, Josh answered. Maybe another 50 acclimatizing farther up the mountain. Now, acclimatizing means that they go up <clears throat> to get their breathing uh, used to being at high altitudes. So they go up a little bit higher to get their lungs used to it and then come back down. Because the higher up you go, the less oxygen is there and your lungs have to get used to it. So you go up high, get used to not having very much air, and then recover and heal. And then you go up high again and you keep working your way up until you get up to the top of the mountain. But your, your lungs have to get used to breathing with less air. Um, but if you tried to do it all at once, your lungs would just you just would suffocate basically because your lungs aren't used to to using so little oxygen most of them must have been in their tents trying to stay warm because there weren't too many people wandering around i looked at the temperature on my watch 14 degrees according to the wind gauge the watch josh gave me did everything the wind was blowing 10 miles an hour which brought the temperature down to three degrees above zero josh looked over at me you breathing okay any problems on the way up? Both were good questions, considering this was only the second time I'd been this high on a mountain. The summer before, I had almost made it to the top of Mount McKinley in Alaska. We were at 18,000, 2,000 short of the summit, when our guide turned his back because of weather. I've had a headache the past two days, I said, but it's going away. Josh pointed at George, who had returned to his tent and was angrily packing his gear. My headache's going away too, he said. At least one of them. He looked over at the truck. Sunho and the brothers had reappeared and were helping Zilpa unload it. Who's the kid? His name's Sunho. Is he with Zilpa? Yeah. Interesting, he said. Did Zilpa tell you he was going to stay at base camp for a few days? I shook my head. Like you said, Zopa doesn't talk much. Yeah, well, he's up to something. Like what? Josh smiled. He'll let us know when he's ready. Let's head over to Peak Experience Headquarters. I'll introduce you to the base camp crew. Peak Experience? I didn't name it after you exactly, Josh admitted, but I probably should have. What are you talking about? Peak Experience is my adventure travel company. We started it last year. Almost wish I had it now. I followed him to a giant orange tent with Peak Experience tagged on the sides. The A in Peak looked like a mountain. <coughs> he pulled back the flap and waved me through. Inside were several people and more electronic equipment than I had ever seen in a tent at 18,000 feet. Or any tent for that matter. Laptops, satellite phones, two-way radios, fax machines, television monitors, and other gizmos. The crew was so busy talking on phones, listening to radios, tapping on keyboards, they didn't seem to notice us. None of them looked like climbers. What is all this? I asked. This is what happens when you get old and start worrying about your future. He pointed to a pudgy guy talking on a satellite phone. That guy over there is my business partner. Thaddeus Bowen. The rest of the people are support staff. There's another bunch of them back in the office in Xing Mei, and some up on K2 and Annapurna. You're running three expeditions at the same time? He smiled. Get this. Most of our clients are rank amateurs. Some haven't been higher than 12,000 feet. Stupid, huh? But I'm not alone. There are at least 10 commercial operations like this at base camp. Some of them are running four separate expeditions. Things have changed since your mom and I were living out of the back of that rusty old van on El Cap. 
When he said that he had clients, I assumed he meant experienced climbers. Nothing like this. People, Josh said. This is my son, Peak. I felt a flush of pride. Some of them nodded. Some smiled. Though none of them <coughs> fully stopped what they were doing. Thaddeus walked over, covering the mouthpiece of his satellite phone. How'd George take the news? He took a punch at me, Josh said. Says he's going to sue. Thaddeus rolled his eyes. Great. I'll call our attorney and tell him to get ready. He walked away, resuming his phone conversation. A woman came over and handed Josh a sheet of paper. The film crew should be here later this afternoon, and I finally tracked down the whereabouts of Holly Angelo. The name sounded familiar to me, but I couldn't remember where I'd heard it. Where is she? Josh asked. She's with the film crew, the woman answered. Apparently she came in on the same flight. The film crew is threatening to murder her. She brought along her own personal chef and massage therapist. And so much gear they had to rent a second truck. I told her she couldn't bring anybody, Josh said, and to travel light. She didn't listen, the woman said. She's also found out that you are you have an opening on your climbing permit. She wants to go to the top. Josh swore. How'd she find out about that? Word travels fast at high altitudes. She's here to cover Peak, not herself. What do you mean? I asked. I'll tell you about it later, Josh said distractedly. Can you reach her on the sat phone? She's not in the middle of a massage, the woman answered, then started punching in numbers. Josh turned to me. I need to take care of this. There's a spot for your tent next to mine, the blue one out back. Why don't you go out and get set up? Sunho helped me haul my gear and set up the tent. When we finished, we took a little tour. Now you might be thinking that base camp on Everest would be one of the most pristine places on earth. The truth is that you have to watch where you step. And here's a tip. Avoid digging up yellow snow to melt for your drinking water. Gross, yellow snow? At 10 degrees below zero, no one strays far from his tent to take care of business. Everest Base Camp is a frozen outhouse garbage dump with decades of crap, discarded food containers, and busted gear. I had read that some of the climbers and Sherpas were trying to clean it up, but by the looks of the camp, they hadn't made much of a dent. <coughs> Sardine cans, chip bags, cartons, toilet paper, and other trash blew around the tents like tumbleweed. Climbers from all over the world were here. Japan, Bolivia, Mexico, Italy, Canada, Luxembourg. There were women's teams, military teams. There was even a team made up exclusively of people over 50. They had a placard outside their camp that read, The Geriatric Team. Beware of grumpy old climbers. You could pick out the commercial climbing operations by the size of their tents and their camp spots, which were usually the best on the slope. I counted 11 of them, and that's when it began to dawn on me that Josh might be just as cagey as old Zopa. There was a lot of competition sitting on the mountain under those large tents. Getting a dozen clients to the summit could bring in as much as a million dollars. Woo! And if you were simultaneously mounting other expeditions on other 8,000 meter peaks, several million dollars if an everest wannabe was going to plop down a hundred grand or several thousand to get to one of the lower camps who are they going to give their money to the company with the best success rate the company with the best safety record or maybe the company who put the youngest person in the world on the world's tallest mountain who also happened to have the same first name as the company that put him on the top. And did you hear about him climbing those skyscrapers in New York? <coughs> Don't worry about the money. I'll get my portion back. The film crew should be here this, later this afternoon. She's here to cover Peak. And suddenly, I suddenly remembered where I had seen the name Holly Angelo. It was a byline under an article about me climbing the skyscraper. 
She was the reporter who broke the news about who my real father was. Did she dig up this information on her own? Or did Josh give her a call and spill his guts? The youngest person so far to reach the top of Mount Everest was a 15-year-old Nepalese girl named Ming Kippa Sherpa. If I were one year older, I might still be in. I stopped in mid-step. So we've got this idea of what Josh is doing right now that he, why he invited Peek to come along. Why he wanted Peek, this young kid, possibly the youngest person to ever climb Mount Everest, to go with him. Because it's good for business. Because then Josh would be the company that put this youngest person in the world on Mount Everest. Interesting. So think about it. Do you think that Josh would have saved him if he hadn't been the youngest person? Hmm. What's the matter? Sun Ho asked. Nothing, I said. Would Josh have bailed me out if I had already turned 15? I didn't think so. Was he using me? Probably. Did I mind? I wasn't sure at that point. He was paying more attention to me than he had my whole life. I'm going to head back, I said. I should go too, Sun Ho said. Zopa wants me to talk to the cook about helping in the mess tent. A job? I asked. <coughs> For room and board, Sun Ho smiled. Or tent and food, I should say. Perhaps it will lead to something else. Tent and food was not going to get the tuition paid. I could talk to my father, I offered. If I asked him, I think he'd hire you for more than tent and food. Sun Ho shook his head. We'd better leave that up to Zopa. He brought me to the mountain. It is for him to decide. <laughs>